morning. Oh, good morning and happy Easter. I'm going to start off this morning with an affirmation. So listen up. Today, I am free to begin anew. Today, I am free to begin anew. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter, Bunny. Isn't it the most perfect day? I am so grateful for the sunshine as opposed to our little snow flurry last week. That was a shock. Oh, the trees on the way out. I love seeing that fresh green and that little bit of baby touch of green along the edges. You know, the pear trees in the city are already blooming with those white bursts. It's so encouraging after the winter we've had. Spring seems to be rushing to remind us that this is a time to embrace new possibilities and that we can bloom in every part of our lives. It is such a huge honor to be here today with you on Easter. As ministers say to each other, it's a big day in the business. <laughs> I really appreciate all of you being here at the New Thought Spiritual Center of Eastern Long Island in Watermill. Wow, what a great new location. Wow. Oh. We see this community just growing and thriving here in this sacred space where everyone who walks through the door feels welcomed and enfolded in the love of God. So in keeping with our theme of renewal for April, it's really awesome to share with you this morning what Hollywood called the greatest story ever told. Now that's a headline, isn't it? The greatest story ever told. I love this time of the year. When you turn on the TV, almost at any time, there's a Bible movie on. All the great epics, the, uh, the robe and King of Kings and the Ten Commandments. Come to think of it, I think I probably learned more Bible history from the movies than I ever did in Sunday school. It's kind of fun to see that there are young filmmakers who are getting interested in the Bible stories now, too. We had Jesus of Nazareth with the really hunky, handsome Jesus. That was pretty amazing. And now there's Noah that's out right now. I can't wait to see that. I think that would be a really fun topic maybe for a talk down the road. But as a Unity Truth student, I'm really thrilled to share this Easter story here in this enlightened community because I think we're going to be able to cut to the chase this morning and buzz right past any traditional retelling of that resurrection story. We're going to go boldly and look for the messages in Easter that are ours to make personal. As a little kid growing up in the Southern Baptist Church, I think I tended to lean more toward the scary type of the Bible, the scary side. So I'm really grateful for Unity's choice to see Scripture through metaphysical eyes where we can use our divine intellect to look for a deeper meaning and then to use that meaning practically right at this moment. We are here today by divine appointment to get to know God better. So let's get started. One of the first verses I think about on Easter morning is from John eleven twenty five that says, I am the resurrection and the life. Metaphysically, we see the resurrection of Jesus as the rising up of the eternal man, the eternal person. The raising of our mind and body from a human perspective to a spiritual consciousness. It's a shift, a change, an awakening to know our power in being one with God. When we are awakened, we become more aware of the power of our words, particularly that I am combination at the, at the front of that verse. When we say, I am, we are claiming our divinity. We're claiming our limitless potential and our ability to overcome anything. We don't waste our breath saying, I'm tired or I'm discouraged. No, we declare that and recognize that we are perfect children of spirit and that we are eternal, ageless, deathless, whole and complete. When Jesus said, he that believeth in me, referring to the Christ spirit within us, greater works than these shall he do. It's our invitation to go beyond our limited thinking and embrace new opportunities, new visions for overcoming. When we're awakened to God, we can really do some amazing things. 
And I'm so glad to have that powerful role model of Jesus. I love it. When I first heard in Unity, Jesus referred to as our older brother and our way shower. I love that. It made it so much more user friendly. You know, I love my big brother so much. I've quoted him many times here, but I always envision that older brother image so welcoming. Eric Butterworth says that when Jesus says, follow me, he was not only headed toward his own goal of divinity, but he was making a trail for us to follow. Follow me into greater awareness of truth, climb higher and rise up. I love that image. I know many days I trailed along behind my older brother in the woods and going across streams, and he was always there to lead us in the right direction. He would always hold back the cane briar so I wouldn't get scratched in the face or hold out his hand for balance when we were wading across the creek. Well, this morning, I hope that we can collectively accept that who we are and what we are is way more than we could ever imagine with just our human brains. We are spiritual beings having a human experience, and we are divine. The spirit part of us can never be in danger or destroyed. That is our true nature. And as James Trapp tells us, when we live in the awareness of our true nature, we fulfill the life that God sees when God sees us. When we become awake to God, we are living what Jesus called life more abundant. Now, in our human bodies, it's easy to fall back asleep sometimes, isn't it? We tend to sleepwalk a little bit, <laughs> tweeting and getting on social media, going on Facebook. Thank goodness we have time on Sunday morning to put the brakes on and turn off those phones and just be here in community and be still, resting in the spirit and welcoming that feeling of spirit inside us. Now, we won't be able to talk about Easter's promise of renewal without a look at the crucifixion experience. We know here on earth that there are no free passes. No one who lives escapes some very deep and painful changes along the way. As we know from the civil rights movement, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. A lot of us here today, I'm sure, have had long dark nights of the soul. When someone experiences a divorce or the death of a partner or the loss of a job, our old identity dies and a new one must be born. In Daniel Abraham's book, The Price of Spring, he writes, we say that flowers return every spring, but that's not true. Even if the flower grows from an ancient vine, the flowers of spring are themselves new to the world. Flowers do not return, rather they are replaced. It is in this difference between returned and replaced that the price of renewal is paid. As it is for the spring flowers, so it is for us. The resurrection story is a reminder that no matter what seems to be happening to us, it does not have the final word. God has the final word. David Brooks is a wonderful writer for the New York Times. He writes a lot of op-ed pieces, and he did a piece about suffering a couple of weeks ago. He says, the unspoken assumption is that the main goal of life is maximum happiness. When we plan for the future, we talk about the good times and the good experiences we hope to have. But when people remember the past, we don't talk about happiness. It's often the ordeals that seem most significant. People shoot for happiness, but we are formed by suffering. Not that it's noble to suffer, but people are ennobled by it. Just last Tuesday, I had the TV on watching the commemoration of the Boston Marathon bombings. What stories of struggle and healing and spiritual resurrection. Suffering, Brooks tells us, brings us deeper into ourselves and gives us a more accurate picture of what we can and cannot control. Well, as an interfaith minister, I tend to associate that word suffering with my understanding of Buddhism and the idea that our human suffering often comes from our attachments, from not being willing to accept that our lives are always going to be changing all the time. And no matter what change comes, whether it's good or bad or indifferent, it really shakes us up. It changes us. 
come to think of it, a lot of the suffering that I experience is because of my attachment to the way I think my life should be. What I want, what I think I need, and what I want others to do and say. Because I am attached to my way or the highway thinking, when things don't work out like I plan, I suffer. When a catastrophic life circumstance comes along, our humanness spins us into that dark night. And way down in that emotional trench, it really comes down to letting go and accepting change. When I'm down there wallowing in that pain, the first thing I am ready to do, usually, is yell at God. Why me? Or like my mom used to say, Lord, have mercy. Why me? That resonated with me on this Easter morning because I always thought that Jesus was yelling at God when he said, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, I was stunned a couple of weeks ago to come across this little bit of information. The phrase, why hast thou forsaken me, is the widely accepted translation but the Lamsa Bible scholars who translated from the Aramaic language that Jesus really spoke translate that phrase as, it is for this purpose I was born. Now that's a shocker. Wow! It is for this purpose I was born. Maybe Jesus wasn't yelling at God. Maybe he knew exactly what was going on and was in a place of acceptance. And if we accept this translation this morning, our lesson is that whatever we're going through, whatever may seem to overwhelm us, we are being formed by it into a new identity. In our human pain, we too can choose to remember when we see with our spiritual vision, we can say, it is for this purpose we were born. This Easter season is a time of huge energy and opportunity. I was in a meditation class last week and our teacher said, please be really mindful between Passover and Easter of all the prayer that is circulating around in the universe in that week. So many traditions are in communion with spirit right now. So many prayers going up. And when we pray, we multiply those prayers more and more. I think about Jesus a lot when I think about prayer. He prayed all over the place, didn't he? Every time he seemed to be turning around and dismissing the disciples so he could go apart and get his act together. I can just hear him saying, guys, give me a minute. <laughs> wow. Whether or not he had a clue about what was coming next in his life, he sure knew how to stay in touch with the Father. So when that really big stuff came along, he was ready. And he was really prayed up. I am so grateful for that time of prayer when I can remind myself that I am not the one driving the bus here. I know when I am in prayer, it's all going to turn out okay. So here's another little personal lesson for us for Easter. The gift of forgiveness. Another familiar verse that we hear in that greatest story ever told is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, I'm a little cynical about that one, whatever the translation is. I think those guys knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, but this morning, if we're going to look at that with a new perspective, let's take that personal. When we think about those people who betray us, or harm us, or gossip about us, or criticize the way we live our lives. Take a deep breath now. Oh, just try and see them for just a moment as a blessing. Here's the secret. They are our teachers. Sometimes there are people who are put into our lives just to stir us up and aggravate us so much that they make us turn to prayer. And that's the blessing. <laughs> Spirit invites us to see those teachers and accept us. And you know what? They really are doing us a favor by making us turn over to prayer. Give that a little try out today. <laughs> Some of you may know that I'm headed toward retirement from my professional career at the end of this year, I hope. 
And while I'm really grateful to be at this crossroads where I can spend more time in ministry and turn my energy in that direction, sometimes in the middle of the night it's really easy to get a bad case of the what ifs. What if I didn't save enough? What if my brain or my mind or my heart poops out? What if? What if? I'm sure everybody in here has had a night of those what ifs before. And thank goodness we have the option to get up and turn on the light and turn within. I've discovered that 3 o'clock in the morning is really not a bad time to remind myself that I am a child of God, that I am eternal and ageless, deathless, whole and complete. Taking time in prayer to say thank you God for the role models who show me how to live with humor and grace and gratitude. Thank you, God, for every day's opportunity to see the sun and to laugh and to cry and to be love. So the Easter message for me, and I hope for you as well, is that our spirit, our Christ within, is eternal. And the greatest guarantee we have for weathering our human challenges and the inevitable changes are that we are one with God and divinely blessed. And it's all going to turn out okay. Sure, we're going to have those human ordeals to weather, but we are formed by them into new identities. And we draw a little closer each time to know for this purpose I was born. So this Easter Sunday, I invite you to take a little additional time in prayer, maybe tonight right before you go to sleep, and call that words into mind, for this purpose I was born. See what comes up in your mind and in your heart when you say those words. What is the new identity that you're going to claim today? It is never too late to entertain a new possibility. The Buddha reminds us, each morning we are born again. What we do today is what matters most. Today, I am free to begin anew. And so it is. Amen.